Now let's go ahead and add a board. Configure FPGA. Finding out what these values are, I find this is actually one of the hardest things to figure out. Uh, I did this recently. It's the Alcatree AU-IO, and I've, the, I've used this board in a video series. Part of that series, I, I synthesize the design on this board, and it didn't exist. And so I went through a lot of steps to try to get it to work. And uh, while none of it was really hard, it, did, it, it was fairly time-consuming, so I thought I would capture what I learned and stick it in a video. What is it that you need? Well, you need a board schematic first and foremost, because that's going to tell you how things are connected and you need to know how things are connected in order to get the signaling correct. Next thing you need is you need a photo of the board because the Logisim software has the ability to display a photo of the board and then draw a key around each one of the I.O. components on the board so that you can easily identify and form uh, connections to those uh, I.O. devices. Next thing you need, somewhat optional, but I actually found it pretty essential because there were some pieces of information in the board's, in the board vendor's marketing material that I found um, helpful that I didn't have to look in the schematic or in, in other data sheets and so forth. If available, and typically board vendors will do this, they will create a constraint file that is appropriate for the synthesis tool and, of course, the vendor uh, silicon that they used on their board. And if you have that board constraint file, that'll go a long way. But it's not strictly necessary as long as you have the board schematic. The next thing that you need uh, would be that are really useful are other data sheets for components that are on the board schematic. And sometimes these are necessary because to, to come up with signaling information and so forth, it's useful to have the data sheets of those components that are connected to the FPGA in case you need to do some more research on what the signaling characteristics of those components are. And then finally, this is not strictly necessary, but it 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 is helpful, and of course, you're going to ultimately need this anyway to test out your board. You, you need the synthesis software of the FPGA vendor. And of course, you're going to synthesize a test to make sure that your board design works, but it may also be that you use their software as a reference for looking up pin information and, and other things. So the first thing that you have to do after getting your photo is you you launch the board definition utility and you put the photo of the board in. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, the first thing that it's going to ask you then is identify some information about the FPGA. The first thing that it's going to ask for is it's going to ask for the vendor tool suite, if you will, because what you'll see in the, in the dialogues, you'll see Atira, but then you'll see Xilinx, and then you'll see Vavado. Well, Xilinx is a manufacturer and Vavado is a a tool set of which only certain Xilinx products support. Uh, what they really mean when they say Xilinx is they mean ISE. So if you have, I think, the six Spartan six line of chips, for example, you would select Xilinx for a board based on that chipset. The next thing that it asks for is for a family. And, you know, a family usually refers to a, a, a line of chips using a specific fab methodology or maybe some kind of unique architecture. Very strictly, I do not believe family is actually required information to synthesize a design. I don't think that the piece of data that you put in here for family strictly matters, but the, the tool does ask for it. So which vendor or tool suite do you pick? The first stop to figure that out most likely will be the marketing material for the particular board that you bought. Uh, and in this case, the Alcatree AU board that I'm doing is uh, was purchased from SparkFun. The company that actually produced it, it's called Alcatree, and, uh, that did the design, but uh, SparkFun is the, uh, is the hardware vendor that 
put it together, fabricated it for Alcatree. Um, so very first thing is, you know, you're trying to figure out, well, what vendor, you know, who's, who's silicon is this? The, the board manufacturer put Xilinx. Okay. So we know that this is a Xilinx board and with Arctic seven, that sort of sounds like a line to me of chips. Xilinx has, uh, two different software synthesis products, and so this was this was pulled off Xilinx's developer website. And so if you look at this page, it says ISC Design Suite supports Spartan Six, Vertex Six, and Cool Runner devices, as well as previous generations. So this the ISC product is for uh, Xilinx's older chipsets. Xilinx recommends Vivado for new designs, starting with Vertex Seven, Kintex Seven, Arctic Seven. So see, there's the there's the line right there and zinc seven, 7,000. So, so there you have it. So that's how you know that for this, for this board, we're going to need the Vivado platform. So the family, we, we mentioned that this, the Arctic seven, that's the family of this, the silicon, the, uh, the, the silicon belongs to the Arctic seven family. The next thing you need that is very important is the part. And the part identifier is for sure used in programming. And it identifies, you know, the internal characteristics of a given of a given chip uh, within a given family. So, for example, it might identify, say, the number of uh, LUTs or, you know, other uh, resources that are, that are on the chip. So for the part... You know, it says Arctic 7 XC 7A 35T minus 1C. So this looks like it could be a part number, but how do you know for sure? On Xilinx's website again, here's the 7 series data sheet. Uh, one of the pages that you'll find in a data sheet like this typically is how the vendor specifies the part number. And I only printed the first few pages. It's actually a very, it's a fairly large, it's a larger document, but this is, it's on page 16 of the document. You can see uh, here, this little section, where uh, they break out for you the device type right here, which is the part, as described in the Logisim product uh, on the dialog that I'll show you in a minute, the part field is is this is this field right here. And so that device type matches this number right here up to the dash. Next thing you're going to need is the package uh, identification. And again, this is used in programming. It's important for the tool, the synthesis tool, to know how many pins the part has. Uh, sometimes the configuration of the pins matters, or, or at least the package identifier has the has some information on it about the type of package that the pins are formed in. Again, if we look over here, we do see some package identification, you know, starting from here over you know, over to here, this, this looks to me like a packaging number. Okay. So a lot of times what you wind up having to do is go to the schematic because usually the schematic is going to put full part numbers of the parts that are on the board. So here we have a schematic of the Alcatree AU board. This was pulled from Spark from Spark Fun's website. And if you look carefully right here, you can see XC7 835T. So there's the part number. And then you see right here what looks suspiciously like the package number. Next, so the next piece of information you're going to need is the speed grade of the chip. And this is very important because the, synth the synthesizer 
needs to know the speed grade in order to be able to um, compute timing operations correctly. Well, if we go back to So as you can see, the speed grade is indicated by these dashed numbers, right? And as, as an example in this part number. So um, you would think on the schematic, right? You would see the full Xilinx part number, but you don't. How do you know? What the speed grade is. Well, again, you can look on the chip, which, you know, that's fine. You look on the chip, and we may do that, but look back here, and you can see minus one right here. So we know the speed grade of the device that's on the board is the minus one speed. Next piece of information you're going to need is unused pin behavior. Uh, what that means is if you don't connect a pin uh, on the on the board to some to something, what do you want that pin to do? Do you want it to float? Do you want it to be pulled up? Do you want it to be pulled down? Usual best practice is to not leave pins floating and because that can pick up spurious uh, signaling and so forth. Uh, it's also the case that certain vendors have their own default. Uh, I do not believe, though, that the Logisim tool has the ability to say, don't say anything and just let whatever the default is be. So um, typically what I would do is go look up what the default is for the vendor. So this is from, so we know this is a Vivado tool set chip. And so in the Vivado Programming and Debugging Guide, again on Xilinx's website, this is page 67, uh, we find this diagram here that describes uh, various configuration settings that apply to the overall design. And as we can see here, um, this bitstream config unused pin says it adds uh, pull up, pull down, or neither to unused select I.O. pins. It has no effect on dedicated config pins. The list of dedicated pins varies depending upon the architecture. The pull none setting shows that there is no connection to either the pull up or the pull down. And you have pull up, pull down, or pull none as the uh, various selections. Uh, so the question is, what should be the setting for the board? Next piece of information you need is, is information about the clock that's connected to the FPGA. Obviously, you need to know the clock's frequency. Well, again, back to marketing material. It's usually the first place I look because there's less to read usually. Um, it says right here. 100 megahertz onboard clock. You need to know the pin location of the clock. The easy way to do it, let's talk about the easy way. The easy way is if you have a constraint file. And a constraint file for the Vivado product looks something like this. Now, where you might ask, where do you get this constraint file from? Well, the, vent, the board vendor's uh, GitHub site might be a good place to start. They may not necessarily advertise or promote, hey, come get your constraint file here. So it requires some dig. It requires some digging through the site to try to find it. Um, I did that. I mean, this is the constraint file for the Alcatree AU board. Uh, and I, I found it on Alcatree's GitHub website. Uh, what, what I discern from looking at this is that, so we're talking about creating the clock, and here, here's package pin, and then there is N14. The voltage standard here, IO standard, uh, LV CMOS 3.3, so it's a 3.3 volt um, voltage setup. Now, what if you don't have this file? 
How can you figure it out? Well, that is where the schematic can be handy. So, what we're looking for is a crystal or a clock module or some some kind of oscillating device, right? Now, you know, if I, I have these printed out just because I like dealing with paper sometimes, if I had this, like, you know, showing you electronically, we could do some searches. So we could do a search for something like clock or CLK. Interestingly, when you do that on this on this diagram, you don't get the location of where the crystal is. <laughs> I'm going to cut to the chase. This is this is six pages long. There's you know there's all sorts of stuff across these pages, but I'll cut to the chase and show you here. This is the clock module for the board, and. Uh, I just happened to stumble on it by just looking at the diagram, you know, looking at each page and trying to discern where can I see a clock. And if you look very carefully, I can zoom in here, right here, 100 megahertz. Well, you know, we saw that in the marketing material. And uh, so that, you know, that's, that's got to be the clock. And again, the data sheet, if you look that number up, you get a data sheet that looks like this. We'll come back to that in a second. What we're actually trying to figure out is, if we didn't know that N14 was the pin, can we figure it out from the schematic? So there's the output from the clock. Here's the pin identifier, 100 MH, MHC slash 24D. If you look, on the schematic, again, here's the, th this is the FPGA, the pins for the FPGA, and they are scattered out in different places, right? But if you look right here, there's the input for the oscillator, and you can see pin 14, pin in 14 right there. Uh, you need to define the pull behavior of the pin. So does the clock itself uh, drive the pin high and drive the pin low, or does it leave one of those states uh, up to you to, you know, pull the pin up or down? Should the question then is, should this pin be pulled up, pulled down? Really, sorry, this pin in 14, should this pin be pulled up, pulled down, or left to float? Well, it's an input, right? Because the clock is driving it. And the question is, what does this clock module do to this Due to this pin when it drives it, does it drive it high and drive it low, or does it just drive it high and it expects to be pulled down or, you know, whatever. So that can be obtained from the data sheet. And if you look here, you can see that the output voltage, the high output voltage is uh, is a minimum of 0.8 times VDD. And this is a 3.3 volt device somewhere. Yeah, right here. Supply, well, it's, it, it can take up to 3.3 volts. And we'll look on the schematic and I'll show you that it's that's what it's connected to. So we can see that the output is driven high, uh, a minimum of 0.8 times VDD. And then it's also driven low with a maximum low voltage of 0.2 times VDD. So it's driven both directions. And so what that tells me is you just need to let the pin float. And then, of course, back to here, you need to know what the voltage expectation of the pin is. And so you can see here that uh, this, uh, this device is connected to 3.3 volts. And then you need to define the pin's voltage standard. What's it going to accept? This is the dialog that you get uh, for the Alcatri AU board. And this is the information that I was, uh, you know, I've gathered that I've described for you. 
uh, where you can see it all in one place here, where clock information on the left and the uh, identifying information on the right, again, specifying Vivado for the Vivado toolset and the family and uh, the other pieces of information. So let's talk now for a second about the layout of this specific board. As you can see, four seven segment displays with decimal points. It's got five uh, momentary push button switches. It has three banks of eight single color LEDs. And it has three banks of eight dip switches. And that's on the top of the IO board. On the bottom, these are, these are actually two boards mated together. On the bottom, the bottom board has another series of eight single color LEDs and another momentary push button switch. So the point of the exercise is to define uh, inputs and out to define pin locations and other signaling characteristics for each one of these components on the board, such that when you do a design, you then assign uh, inputs and outputs of, of your top to where you want them to be routed uh, onto the board. And so when you go about that process, what you wind up doing is you draw rectangles and um, all you simply do is you just start drawing and it'll draw a rectangle wherever you want on the picture of the board and it'll turn red. And then when you when that happens, it brings up a dialog like so, where you can define any given uh, I.O. as one of these that's listed here on this dialog. So let's just go through each one of the devices that are on the Alcatry board to give you a sense of, of what kind of information that you need to gather and enter into the tool in order to make the board work. You need the pin location. So this, this is for an LED. You need obviously the pin location that the LED is connected to. You need the driving voltage standard of the pin. You need the drive strength. Now, in certain cases, I've found that this is not necessary. Um, there is a default setting that Logisim provides, and I, I've been leaving things as default, but um, perhaps for some architectures, this is uh, necessary and important. And then you put in whether whether the I.O. device is considered active on high or active on low. The baseboard has got its schematic, and then if you plug a hat or some, some other kind of device in on top of that, then that's going to have a schematic as well. And so what you see on this schematic, this is the baseboard schematic, you see eight LEDs, and you see a momentary push-button switch. And these are the only I.O. devices, well not exactly true, but th these are the ones that we care about or that I care about for the definition, right? Uh, the IO hat is on another schematic. And here are all of the 24 LEDs, right? And what you can see here is that one side of the LED, the cathode, goes through a 330 ohm resistor and then goes to ground. So these are the uh, are tunnels to the pin eventually going to the FPGA. Now, so L1 is defined here, which is on uh, connector bank B1B, which is BB21. It's not obvious from the schematic, but the pin on the FPGA is B, is this identifier right here, and then this number right here, B21. So let's just do that again. So L2 would be B20. Now, again, I had found a constraint file. And as you can see, B20 
and B20 conform to these three banks of eight LEDs. So I got I had some confidence after looking at the schematic because I also had the constraint file that these numbers matched up here. And so this is what the dialog for defining the LED looks like with those uh, pieces of information in them. The next uh, item on the Alcatry board is a seven segment display. First piece of information you need is the segment, what's called the segment A orientation. So there are various segments of seven segment displays where segment A can be located it's the starting segment can be located in different places on the on the LED. And so there's a drop down that defines the orientation of where segment A is. Usually, for most devices, segment A is on top, but not always. And that's why the data sheet for the LED is important. So here is our data sheet. And here is our digit, and the top segment is A. And then we, you need the pin, lo the, the pin locations of where this, each one of the seg seven segment LEDs are located on the FPGA. We need to know what the, again, the pin locations, the pin numbering, we need to know where A wires up to on the FPGA to get the pin number for it. And we can see that A is going through 330 ohm resistor. So there's our current limiting resistor for the segment that then goes to R, RA. And where does RA go? RA. is right here. And so we know that that segment is connected up to A5. We want to be, again, really, really sure. Back to the constraint file just to confirm. And we can see right here, IO segment A5. The IO voltage standard that you want to assign to those pins to drive the LED. Next, how do we know what the I.O. standard is? Well, well, one way. Again, let's look at the schematic. Goes up to VCC, and VCC for this board is 3.3 volts. Again, the drive strength, if, if applicable to your board design. And whether or not a given segment, when it's active, you signal it high or you signal it low for being active. So again, these are so these are active low. Uh, so when you when you drive these low, this MOSFET has to be turned on in order for these LEDs to light. And so the dialog looks like this for defining a seven segment display. Now seven segment displays are these displays are multiplexed where the anode or the cathode, depending upon what kind of seven segment display you have, would be uh, driven and all of the segments are connected together in parallel such that you multiplex by turning on rapidly the anode or the cathode uh, along with a given segment or several segments to light up one of the seven segment displays, but you do it, you know, 30 times a second or whatever, so that your eye sees all of the displays on simultaneously, even though they are not. And so uh, what you need in order to do this is to identify the, uh, the common segments. Is the IO pin driving an anode or a cathode? And obviously you need to know what the pin location of that is. And you need to know the I.O. standard. And so, you know, again, common segments are those are those segments that are wired together 
in parallel, if they are. I mean, they don't have to be, but if they are, uh, you know, you, you, you'll you define one common set of segments uh, that are connected respectively to the same pin on the FPGA uh, across all of the individual seven-segment displays. In the particular case of the Alcatry board, and it may be the same with others, there are MOSFET drivers that switch the uh, anode or the cathode. Uh, and so it's important to know whether that exists on your particular board because the MOSFET may have driving characteristics of its own. And MOSFET characteristics uh, can vary depending upon whether they're enhancement or depletion mode uh, type MOSFETs and whether they're N-channel or P-channel MOSFETs. And so, you know, this table gives you a summary because I had to go through this myself uh, in order to determine how the gate needs to be driven in order to be able to turn the MOSFET on or off. And the way that you would signal uh, an anode or a cathode to be turned on or off is you just simply define it as an I.O. port. These MOSFETs are connected to pins of their own. So the first thing we need to know is what's the pin definition? Well, so for this one's AN3. And we can see AN3 right here must be A8. And again, if we go back to the data sheet, we can see we've got an A8 for IO select, which is dealing with the seven segment displays. Okay. Next thing that we need to know is, well, is this, is this um, active high or active low? What is it, what is it that you need to send to this pin to turn this MOSFET on? Well, and this is where you, you really need to know what these symbols mean. So this is a MOSFET, and in particular, it's a P and B MOSFET because the arrow is pointing in. And it's an enhancement mode offset. That's what these three dashed lines mean. And a P and P MOSFET means that if the gate voltage is driven high, then this MOSFET will be turned off. And if this is driven low, this will be turned on. So this is an active low. This, this signal right here is active low. So the next component we'll talk about is a dip switch. Fairly straightforward, although the switch number one orientation on a dip switch can vary. And so knowing where the number one switch is, is important. Typically, at least on the example that I have, the switch number one is showing up on the left-hand side of the switch. Again, the pin location of the FPGA related to where they're connected to the pins on the switch, an IO voltage standard on how to drive the pins, and then pull behavior. If you want the uh, inputs to the FPGA to be pulled uh, high or low, and this again depends upon how your dip switch is configured, and whether or not the dip switch being active is considered an active high signal or an active low signal. First thing we need to know is the switch orientation, and you can kind of see on the board, actually, yeah. The switch orientation on these switches, the, the pin one is on the left side of the switch. So that's that's the first piece of data. Pin locations, we can see, are identified with these tunnels called dip whatever. So if we go over to, say, dip dip one right there, we can see this is B40. And again, constraint file, very helpful. We can see our, 
our dip switch is here. Yep, sure enough, there is a B40. So this is defining the seventh switch on that on that first bank, which makes sense because again, pin number one is numbered. Pin number one is wired over over here, right? So, so the bit ordering is counted zero through seven this direction. Okay, what's our voltage standard? Again, 3.3 .3 volts, because we can look at here and see we've got the dip switches tied up to VCC, and we know that's 3.3 .3 volts is the standard for the chip. Pull behavior. We have VCC wired up to one side of the switch, and we have a current limiter that the switch that these switches are going through. However, these are connecting directly to the chip, to the FPGA. And so ultimately, uh, in order to have these pins show a low voltage state when this is turned off, we're going to need these to be pulled down. So that needs to be the pull behavior for these switches, pull down. And then again, when they're turned on, they're going to be active in a high state. So that's the active high setting. And so you have the ability to define a dip switch with a variable number of pins. So obviously I should have put that on the list, but knowing the number of pins you have on a given dip package is uh, obviously important. And then once you do that, the dialog presents itself with a list of pins from zero to seven in order of where switch number one starts. And then again, it provides the rest of the information as described. So the next device we'll talk about is a momentary switch. Again, you need to know what the pin location on the FPGA the switch is connected to, the voltage standard that you want the pin to behave as, and then pull behavior of the pin if it's applicable. And then finally, whether or not you consider the momentary switch when engaged to be active, yeah, the signaling to be active high or active low. Those are here. So we can see one side of the switch is connected up to 330 ohm resistors that are connected up to VCC. And then the other side of the switch is going to, again, the FPGA. So let's take S S5, for example. And here it is right here. So here's S5. And so that should be C. C49. And here we are, C49, IO button. Again, voltage standard, these are going to VCC, so 3.3 .3 volts. Pull behavior. So again, one side of the switch is going up to VCC, but the other side of the switch is going directly to the pin. So again, if we want these to show logic low, this pin needs to be pulled down. So that's the pull behavior for the switch is pull down. And then again, it's active high because when you enable, when you push the switch, that's going to make it active and that's going to wind up showing five volts to the pin, or sorry, 3.3 .3 volts to the pin. And so the button dialog looks like so. So finally, I wanted to share with you the, a link uh, with all the resources, and this presentation will be available in the description of the video. But you can see it was a fairly exhaustive uh, set of resources that I went through, and uh, they are documented here. All of my, okay, there we go. So all of my potential destinations show up. Okay, so the dip center is this one. And the dip right is that one. And the dip left is that one. So you can kind of see how this uh, how this goes now. Um, this is kind of kind of strange how this is showing up, but uh, 
I guess not to worry. We'll just keep trucking here. So again, it's kind of buggy. Okay, so uh, IO LED zero is going to be this one. And then there's one. So you see what I'm going to do, what I'm doing here. I won't bore you. I'll just go and continue to map uh, the rest of these. When I get to the, to the selectors and to the LED, I, I'll come back because that might be a little more interesting. Okay, so I have all the discrete LEDs mapped and the dip switches mapped. So we're going to go do the enable pins for the and the, and the, the enable pins for the seven segments and the seven segment itself. Well, let's do the seven segment first. So there's that one. And then let's do the enable pins. So this will be zero, one, two, and three. And then finally the switches. So this was switch zero, one, two, three, and four. Wow. So I think that's all. Moment of truth. We are going to synthesize. I didn't have the state configuration quite right off of these muxes, demuxes. Uh, the input, I, I decided to drive high instead because, you know, every time every time the selector ticks, it it's going to tick one of these high and drive the rest of them low. However, th th each one of the segments are exposed as the cathode. So and the anode is common, so driving each one of these low will turn it on, assuming that the enable, the anode enable, is turned on. So uh, th this will be sending a high signal through, and every, one, every time this counts, one of these will go high. So in order to turn the LED on, when one of these is high, I ran each one of these things through inverters. And then down here, this is the enable for each one of the seven segment LEDs. And again, driving the input high or, or fixing the input high will cause each one of these to go high once this select counter increments, which it will do after cycling, after this counter cycles through all the segments. However, the on the uh, schematic for each one of the enable signals, uh, the anode is driven by a PNP a MOSFET and in order for that MOSFET to be turned on you have to drive the signal low so when this when this is driven high you need an inverter in order to turn the anode to the on state so that's uh, that change was required to make all of these work correctly and then finally these still don't work and the reason they don't, well, the, the LEDs are fixed on, but the switches are not turning them off. And the reason why that is, is because there's a bug in Logisim. Two bugs that I found. Let me zoom. So the switches themselves, this one as an example, switch two. The set property, uh, should have attached to it a pull down directive because the switch itself on the schematic is not does not have its own pull down it it uh just one end of the switch connects to the pin and the other switch connects to connects to vcc through a 330 ohm resistor i think uh, so the pin is left in a floating state when it's not pressed which uh, comes through as a high, which is why the LEDs stay on all the time. Uh, th on the in the Logisim uh, user interface, uh, when we designed the board, the pin was set to pull down, and that should, in my opinion, translate into this property page in this property getting set to a pull down. And if you do that, then I think the synthesizer will pull the pin down to ground, and then those LEDs will be in the off position. And by the way, these this file is generated, it is one of the files that's generated by Logisim. Uh, it happens to be in, I'm in Windows, so it's in C users, your username, and then there's a Logisim directory. And then under that Logisim directory is your project, and then uh, all of these uh, directories appear. All right, so I spent 
a little time looking at the Logisim source code and to try to fix this uh, this pull down problem. And I finally did get it fixed. So just to close the loop here, you know, these buttons should light the corresponding LEDs that was done on the design. And I cycle, you know, when I cycle through all of them, if I can get my <laughs> fingers out of the way here. So yeah, they all, they all now work properly. So this whole thing, this board map for this Alcatry board in Logisim is now, is now working as I designed it. So all the, all the ports now seem to be mapped correctly. So we just take a look just in case you're curious, if you ever want to go and look at the source code for uh, Logisim, uh, the Logisim uh, GitHub site is very useful in telling you how to get the source code. You click on the developer's link and it gives you the instructions. The constraint file wasn't showing the pull down set for the pin. So the fix was actually very simple. It was basically these, these lines right here that looked at the pull behavior of the pin. And if it's pull up or pull down, uh, I just added the property that set pull up or pull down to true for the port in question. And this is located in the Vivado download.java file. There's, there's a different file for each uh, IDE or each synthesis tool supported. Um, I will be uh, creating a pull request. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the Alcatry board in here as well. I think there's a section for boards. So I'll put the defi board definition in and I will put this uh, change in and we'll make a pull request. And then hopefully the uh, Logisim developers will uh, integrate it and merge it for anybody that wants to use it. Thanks for watching.